Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Counter Clock World by Philip K. Dick. Uh, this is a science fiction novel in which sort of time flows backwards and people start rising from their graves to the point at which there's a company that goes around and, you know, checks for signs of life and digs them back out. I'm going to read you the blurb, I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, time runs backwards in the Counter Clock World. Old men emerge from their graves, grow to middle age, youth, adolescence and childhood to be finally unborn in their mother's wombs. The most powerful, and most feared, organisation in the world is the library in charge of expunging the written records of events which have no longer happened. When a powerful Negro leader is reborn, the library's one concern is to em eliminate him before the renewal of racial violence tears the country apart. But it isn't that simple. And uh, this was written in 1967 and published in 1968. 68 is the year Martin Luther King was assassinated. So that kind of gives you a feel for how on the ball and on the pulse Philip K. Dick was with it. So, and I just think it starts out really well. Uh, I'm just going to read you the opening three paragraphs, and they're quite short ones. As he glided by the extremely small out-of-the-way cemetery in his airborne prowl car late at night, Officer Joseph Tinbane heard unfortunate and familiar sounds. A voice. At once, he sent his prowl car up over the spiked iron poles of the badly maintained cemetery fence, descended on the far side, listened. The voice said, muffled and faint, My name is Mrs Tilly M. Benton, and I want to get out. Can anybody hear me? Officer Tinbane flashed his light. The voice came from beneath the grass. As he had expected, Mrs Tilly M. Benton was underground. Uh, and then she comes out and she says, Is it still 1974? I have to know. Please tell me, sir. And Tinbane says, It's 1998. Oh dear, dismay. Well, I suppose I must get used to it. Uh, and then uh, we get the Flask of Hermes Vitarium, um, which is basically the company that helps to dig people back out. And it says, the firm occupied a small wooden rented building which had survived World War Three and even portions of World War IV. And I have a poem which went, uh, uh, World War Three will be fought with nuclear weapons. World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. World War V will be fine because there'll be no one left alive to fight it. Uh, and then I thought this bit was interesting. I'm just going to read out the, the full, uh, full paragraph here. Again, the tall Negro smiled his mechanical smile. And mechanical it was. Doug Appleford now perceived the small but brilliant yellow stripes sewed on the tall man's coat sleeve. This person was a robot required by law to wear the identifying swathe so as not to deceive. Realising this, Appleford's irritation grew. He had a strict, deeply embedded prejudice against Robies, which he could not rid himself of, which he did not, which he did not want to rid himself of, as a matter of fact. I mean, that's basically Judaism, isn't it? Uh, chapter 4 is started by this quote from uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, which, I mean, I buy it. If, therefore, God existed, there would be no evil discoverable. Someone considers briefly blackmailing a woman into becoming his mistress, and then thinks, that's terrible, what kind of person am I? On the other hand, in the final analysis, it didn't matter what you thought, it was what you did, which I suppose is a fair point. Uh, and then someone points out about someone's wife, he says, um, da -da -da. and with this anti-time, this Hobart phase, she's getting younger and younger. Pretty soon she'll be a teenager, and then she'll be in grammar school, and about the time he's back to his prime of, say, around my age, she'll be a baby. A baby! And then so someone says here, what a thing to look forward to, childhood. Being a baby again, being helpless, waited on. Every day I try to be more grown up. I fight all the time against it, the way ladies used to fight being old, getting middle-aged, fat, with wrinkles. As a character here, he says, um, she isn't scared of you a bit, is she? Women are never scared of men they've been to bed with. And then, this just made me laugh for some reason. Uh, the headline of the Chicago Monday Herald was, drunken father eats own baby. And then I thought this was interesting. Uh, we have a showdown, we get, he shot, aimed too high, aimed at an adult, passed over the head of the tiny child standing there. Adult agents who have dwindled, he realised, as he took aim again. Can I kill a child? But it's going back into a womb anyway, it's time is short. He started to fire again at the four of them darting about inside the motel. So just like, the way, I think it's really well thought out how that would happen, you know, in this world, in this scenario. We get a use of the word stumblingly, which I did not like at all. <laughs> We get this, which I thought was cool, bearing in mind this was written in 67. Uh, Roberts wore a simple dark robe and a skull cap, and on his right hand, a ring. One ring to rule them all, he thought, remembering his Tolkien. One ring to find them. One ring to, how did it go? Bring them all, and in the darkness bind them, in the land of Mordor, where the shadows lie. Another interesting little bit of world building here, so... Um, Eagerly, at the refrigerator filled with various favourite victuals ready to go to the supermarket, 
He inspected the small white cartoon which Jack, which Jack, he inspected the small white cartoon which Giacometti and the robot had left him. To his disappointment, it contained only three items: LSD in vapor under pressure form to be set off by grenade, an oral antidote to the LSD, probably a phenothiazine, to be carried in a plastic capsule in his mouth during his hunt at the library. Those made up two of the three, and the third. He studied it for several minutes, at first not recognising what he held. An intravenous injection device, containing a small amount of pale, sap-like liquid. It came with a removable wrapper of instructions, so he removed the wrapper to read the brochure. Thought it was interesting, we get a reference to the um, some of the rebel group or whatever, the Udi Commandos, and they call guns Vox Dei, uh, which means the voice of God. Which I thought was an interesting little nickname for them. And speaking of guns, here we get this. Uh, well, Anne said resignedly, guns have no loyalty. They're not like dogs. Or like Biggie's. Biggie's down there, he's asleep. And then one of the characters, um, he says to uh, the woman, he says, you know you hate to use the vid phone. You dread it. The vid phone is your bed noir, which means your black monster, or your black creature, your black dog. Um, but uh, I relate to that because I don't like doing video calls or phone calls or stuff like that. So yeah, uh, Counterclock World by Philip K. Dick, I did enjoy it, I, I prefer the first half to the second half, um, I thought the pacing was maybe a little bit off, I really like the concepts, and I thought the execution overall was pretty good, and it's definitely a thought-provoking book, especially if you bear in mind the time period in which it was written. Overall, I would give Counterclock World by Philip K. Dick a 3.5 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I made of Counterclock World by Philip K. Dick, as always don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video, thanks a lot, bye bye.